Hello, this is an introduction to EWT on particles, explaining their energy and mass. And in the last video, shown that energy flows as waves and a fundamental particle referred to as a wave center, if it moves to minimize amplitude, then subatomic particles can be modeled as a collection of wave centers. And the reason why this is cool is it would be very similar to the way that atomic elements arrange from protons in an atomic nucleus. So let's explore that further. Now the wave center is likely the neutrino, and for two reasons. One, it was calculated to be near the uh, mass or energy of the neutrino at 2.39 electron volts, and there's a second reason that will be shown later. Well, let's assume for now that the neutrino is the fundamental particle. And if it is, it looks something like this. Right? That neutrino or the wave centers were shown in the last video to locate at nodes of standing waves. And the reason is because that's the position where amplitude is zero. Now that's sine wave form. They're actually spherical waves, 3D spherical waves at that. But at least in 2D view, this is what it might look like as uh, what those nodes are as the waves converge. Now it forms a triangular pattern in 2D and it would be a uh, in 3D, it's a tetrahedron, which is a tetrahedral pattern. Now, creation. Assume here that particles might combine, such as this, just like what we see in atoms. And particles can do the same thing. But also, if they're not on nodes, they decay. They're unstable because they're not at the standing wave nodes. So here's creation, otherwise known as oscillation, and decay. Now, because there are two nodes in every uh, wavelength, two standing wave nodes, they're going to be at opposite phase, also called antiphase. And that leads to the creation of two different types of particles, a particle and its antiparticle. And later we're going to show in the forces video that depending on which phase of the wave, it's either going to be constructive or destructive wave interference, which leads to the different types of charges. But it's simply just a placement on a standing wave node. Now, a variable was assigned to the number of wave centers, or neutrinos, that are grouped together in a particle. And that letter is, is given, uh, sorry, it's living in a letter of K. Now there's one, and here is an example of two wave centers, so therefore it's K equals two. But if you look closely there, uh, the illustration had an increase in amplitude. So that's what happens as you continue to increase wave centers. But not only is amplitude increasing, but also the particle radius. Because of the transition point of standing the traveling waves is also based on amplitude. Because when amplitude starts off higher, it takes longer to decrease until you point the point where it transitions now to traveling waves. And so the new values at the core, at least for the amplitude, is proportional now to the number of wave centers, and so is the, the radius. And this was used, as some of the assumptions, not all, to construct uh, what's called the longitudinal energy wave equation. And this is the equation used to model particle energies. And the only variable in this one is k. The others are constant. Now, What's, what it's measuring in terms of volume is a sphere of standing wave energy, and beyond that, waves continue to travel as traveling waves, and that'll be shown to be the electric charge, uh, electric force in the forces video. Now, but everything within there, the standing waves, looks a little bit like this in spherical three-dimensional view now. What's in the middle there is standing waves. And beyond that red line, particle radius, are traveling waves. So everything in the middle of that sphere is the sum of the energy of the standing waves, and that's particle energy. And mass is simply just consideration, uh, without consideration of that in wave and that out wave, c squared. And that's naturally in that equation from the page before. So mass is just energy without that c squared in the equation. And the particle radius is a transition of standing waves to traveling waves where amplitude uh, declines to match that in wave amplitude. 
Now that's the still shot, and here's the computer simulation on the bottom right of that previous page and what it looks like. And what's interesting about it is the comparison now to the electron, the real electron, filmed uh, back in 2008 at Lund University. They're similar. But back to how particles can merge together. Now in nature, particles merge so such as this, and neutrinos, as they come from the sun, uh, have a process known as neutrino oscillation where they can become larger in, in mass and become different types of neutrinos, and this would explain why. Right? But it takes higher energy experiments to produce particles that, that have a larger number of K values. And uh, proton collisions, uh, for example, in uh, accelerators such as CERN uh, do this in high energy experiments. But the particles that are found that are, are stable, such as the ones that appear in nature, like the leptons, they occur at magic numbers that are also seen in atomic elements. So there's some similarities here in the numbers 2, 8, 20, 28, and 50. Those are magic numbers. And the geometries of those are basically patterns of, uh, of tetrahedral patterns of, of symmetry and non-symmetric tetrahedrons. All right, and how do we know this? How do we know that leptons occur at these numbers? It's because of this table on the bottom right, but before I describe that one, I'll describe the atomic elements one in the middle. It's linear between the atomic number and atomic mass, and this has been known for a while, and that's how atomic elements were predicted. So for example, hydrogen with atomic number of one, one proton, has a mass. Uh, helium has two protons. You can predict its mass. Eventually uh, they start to add neutrons. But it's linearized. And you can predict atomic elements based on this. And although it's not easy, the same can be done with particles. And I'm going to blow up that table so you can see it in more detail. So beginning with the neutrino, if you assume the neutrino is the fundamental particle, the equivalent of hydrogen, so in this case it has a particle number k value of 1 at 2.39 electron volts, you can linearize all the particles all the way up there to the Higgs, uh, all fit neatly on a line, if the k value is to the fifth power. And that's the tricky thing about it. You have to take k to the fifth power and a fundamental um, particle as the neutrino, but it can be done. But also, you see the muon neutrino and tau neutrino and the rest of the leptons fall under those magic numbers. So it's very interesting. Now the electron. The electron fits on that table a graph as a k value of 10. All right, so what is it about 10 that would make the electron a very stable particle? Well, 10 is a three-level tetrahedron. And its wave centers would be equally spaced at wavelengths in almost every direction uh, that is approaching, such as this. Everything, all these are at wavelengths, but with exception of certain directions and wave centers, such as the one colored in yellow. Now that's going to cause it to move. But in this case, the particle does not decay, it spins. It's not enough to make the entire structure fall apart. Now the electron has a strange spin. Right? It has a what's called half spin, which is essentially a 720 degree spin, which a sphere can't do that. It can't take two rotations before it returns back to, to normal. Basically one rotation is back to normal. But a tetrahedron, especially one with wave centers that are constantly moving to position themselves and kick off another wave center from the node, which then moves to position itself, can have a strange rotation such as that. And furthermore, it's going to be shown in the forces video that it's really conservation of energy. Here's that longitudinal wave that's coming in and spinning that wave center. That'll be shown in the forces video to be magnetism and then decreasing the outwave based on the conservation of energy. And the motion of uh, wave centers or particles also affects its energy. 
Now here you can see this is just modeled as two in waves without showing the out waves. And assuming that particle is moving from left to right with a velocity v, you can see the difference in what is the lagging wavelength and the leading edge wavelength. And this is a familiar property of waves, and it's modeled all the time. You know, for example, uh, with radar detectors, it's the Doppler effect. And if you take the leading, uh, the geometric mean of the leading and lagging edge wavelengths, that's the Lorentz factor. And so this explains in the standing waves, what's captured as a standing wave energy now of that particle explains how it can be relativistic, and it's simply wave uh, wavelength changes. So here's a summary now of what was shown earlier of all the particles that were linearized. And because there's so many similarities to atomic elements, they've been placed here into the periodic table of particles. And have everything from the neutrino there, which is the top left uh, box with a k value of 1, a particle count of 1, to the Higgs, which is down there at the bottom right or at 117 near the end of the table. And the red boxes you see there are the magic numbers, where the leptons fall. And color-coded in there is a categorization of some of the other particles. But you see that there's many more particles uh, still remaining, boxes that might likely be found as energy um, uh, is increased in particle collision experiments, but also in neutrino experiments, probably in the lower part of that table. So there are probably going to be many more particles that are yet to be found.